So the Bethesda resolution really focused on biomedical research. Um, the Budapest one was very open. It didn't really have any sort of subject alliance. Um, but Bethesda really focused on biomedical research. Um, the definition of open access that they put forward was very similar to Budapest, except it included the notion of derivative works. And Sarah will talk about derivative works a little bit more in the copyright section. Um, but basically, these are things like translations and things of that nature. Budapest didn't really touch on that. Um, also, if you go, oh, and um, this was hosted by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, um, which is why they're up there, and why it's called the Bethesda uh, Resolution. Um, so when you go to their websites, there are statements from three groups, um, institutions and funding agencies, libraries and publishers, and scientists and their societies. So again, all three people um, came together, all three types of people came together to create the Bethesda Resolution. The last one um, was hosted by the Max Planck Society in Berlin, and it's called the Berlin Declar Declaration. Now this one focused on the sciences and the humanities, and um, took a slightly different spin because they brought in things about the cultural heritage institutions, they also discussed promotion and tenure and changing the model of promotion and tenure. And also, we get, with their statement, they talk about being able to, and using, evaluation and assessment of open access journals. Um, uh, so with the three of these, you can see there are um, different flavors and different emphases put on open access from these three different groups. And so Budapest is usually the one we cite the most, um, and really kicked off um, kind of the very, the public open access movement. That's not to say that Budapest started at all, but it was the first time people came together and put something out there that really codified what people had been talking about previous to the, to the resolution. So um, open access globally has been um, in the works for uh, many years. ePrints is um, an open source repository platform that was started in um, 2000, <coughs> predates the Budapest Open Access Resolution. Um, Sherpa Romeo, um, still in use today. Sherpa Romeo is a, uh, I'm not gonna get this acronym right, the Joint Information Systems Committee um, is a UK is a UK group. Sherpa Romeo is the place where um, it's a publisher copyright policy database and is updated all the time. Um, Juliet was released a few years later, and that is an um, and it's open access. And Juliet is the funder policy uh, piece of that. So you can go to either one of these websites, search on publisher name or search on journal names. And with Juliet, you can search on funder names, so Howard Hughes, or uh, Welcome Trust, or Autism Speaks. Um, any of those will be included, and they'll give you a rundown of what the expectations are for um, if you get funding for a certain branch, or if you want to publish with a specific journal. Um, the Directory of Open Access Journals, DOAJ, that started in 2003, and that's, um, headquartered at Lund University. And then the Public Knowledge Project um, started at Simon Fraser. And they have uh, an open journal system, so it's an open source publishing platform. And they follow that up more recently with um, open conference systems and open monograph systems. So you have the capacity at your institution to support um, open source <coughs> publishing conferences or books these are tools that would be of extreme interest to you. In the United States, um, archive.org and PubMed Central also predate Budapest. Um, PubMed Central is the central database um, by the, uh, sponsored by the National Institutes of Health, where uh, faculty and researchers are required to deposit um, their articles 12 months, at least 12 months after publication as according to the NIH public policy. Um, the Public Library of Science um, started in 2001, and that was um, as a direct result 
of a letter that was published in was it Nature or Science? Was it Nature? Or Science? <coughs> uh, by the three founders. Michael Eisen was one of them, and he's still involved with, with FOSS. They did not become a publisher until 2003, but since then, um, they have FOSS One, they have FOSS Biology, they have a whole suite of open access journals um, in the sciences. Um, MIT Open Courseware started in 2002, um, so they've been going strong with open courses, um, you know, far before we even began thinking about OOPS. Um, the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition is a membership organization. Um, both of our institutions are members, and they are very, very active in advocacy and also lobbying in Washington. They also have a student arm called the Right to Research Coalition, which started, um, I believe, in about probably six years six years ago, I want to say. Um, and then Creative Commons, which is a tool that works within copyright that allows authors to communicate to readers what the readers can do with a specific article um, or a specific image. If you search on Flickr, there's actually a way to limit your search to Creative Commons um, images. And there's also other websites that allow um, musicians to uh, create music and license it under Creative Commons. So, um, and that works within copyright. And it's a great way for people to understand what they can do with something. Um, I also want to say on the global front that, you know, a lot of these things are centered in the UK, which has this great infrastructure and great activity around open access. But we've also seen open access declarations and support um, coming from countries like China, like Hong Kong, France, Italy. So if you go to the open access directory and look at their timeline, you can see kind of what countries are doing what and sort of the ebb and flow of activity around open access around the world. Can I just add yeah. something? I think an interesting sort of uh, connection to that is actually increasingly governments uh, are paying attention to open data, so not research data producing universities, but actually government data, um, and trying to set up systems that are really focused on ways in which citizens can utilize that data in very different ways. And you see this trickling down from both federal level in the US to also state and even municipal levels. So it's, I think it's a, you know, it sort of goes to that sort of general theme of of openness and then use, machine readability, etc. Um, I think San Francisco actually has been very out there with their open data initiatives. I don't know that much about it, but that struck me like a whole city is really, you know, behind this. Um, and I believe Northeastern University in Boston is doing some interesting partnerships with the Department of Transportation. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of really interesting experiments going on between different, um, between governments and academia. Um, I'm not gonna go through each of these, but I wanted to give you a sense that legislative <coughs> efforts had not been confined just to the past couple of years. In 2003, the Public Access to Science Act was introduced. And I also wanna say that these pro-OA policies have been bipartisan, which I think is great. There's something we can all agree on, you know? <laughs> no matter what side of the aisle you're on, there's something about open access that everybody likes. Um, you know, there's there's been anti-OA legislation introduced as well. Sarah talked about the Research Works Act. Um, but where I want to focus a little bit of time is on the NIH public policy, because that is really significant, because it was the first OA policy for a major public agency in the US. It was the first to be demanded by a legislature. And, and that the NIH itself is one of the world's largest funders of research. So since this was introduced, I think, um, I, you know, I want to say millions of articles have been added to PubMed Central. When it was first introduced, there was only about a 4% compliance rate. And nobody was really happy with that. The NIH wasn't happy with that. Congress was not happy with that. So 
because at the beginning it was just a request, like, please do this because it would be really great. And we believe in open access. This is taxpayer funded. We want people to be able to get to what they pay for. Um, so 2004 or 2005, it was requested. In 2008, it became a requirement, a legislative requirement. Um, it was part of an omnibus appropriations bill that Bush signed it. Um, in 2012, NIH announced that there would be strict compliance measures and people would not, um, if people uh, had a grant pre-2012, applied for another one, they would check to make sure that those researchers were in compliance um, and had <coughs> deposited their work um, before they could be considered for another round of grant funding, which is huge. This is huge for us in the United States. Um, now, two things that, that some open access advocates don't like about the NIH policy is that there's a 12-month embargo, so there's a delay to the open access. And also there's no data sets required for some good reasons, I think. Um, but those are two criticisms that we often hear about. All right, so skip ahead to 2013. Um, the Fair Access to Science and Technology Research, otherwise known as FASTER, and then the White House Office of Science and Technology Directive that Sarah mentioned. Both of those came out within a week of each other. And so you can imagine, uh, you know, we were all on Twitter. It was a very, very exciting week to 10 days um, when these two things were announced in such close uh, proximity to each other. So here's the text of the, um, the directive. Um, there's a couple interesting things here. You can get to the, uh, the new policy memorandum, so the, the full text of the actual policy that lays out what people need to do. And then there's also a response to the We the People petition that really helped seal the deal for the directive. Um, okay. Oh, and then a late entry into the discussion is the Public Access to Public Science Act, otherwise known as PACS, that was introduced into the House last Thursday. So, um, I want to recognize Peter Super here. He really is a rock star. So on his, um, and actually the next part of my presentation borrows very liberally from his comparison between FASTER and OSP, OSTP directive. Um, so I just wanted to break these down a little bit because they came out at the same time and they're asking for very similar things in different ways. All right, so FASTER came through our legislative branch. The directive came from our executive branch. Very significant and, and awesome. Clear, clear reasons. Um, the White House had been collecting public comments on the federal open access policy, um, and then they were also pressured by the We the People petition um, in May 2012. And FASTER builds on that whole list of other legislative efforts that go back to 2003. So FASTER, that is still under debate. It's been introduced, it's in the it's, you know, going through the wheels, the cogs. Um, the directive, that is a done deal. That was an executive order. We are all living with it now. We're all trying to figure out exactly what it means and exactly how our institutions will move forward with it. Um, and the agencies are also trying to figure out how they will roll with this and what changes they need to make in order to fund people effectively. So both ask a wide range of agencies to require open access. FASTER um, requires about 11 agencies with $100 million or more in extramural funding <coughs> to require open access, but the directive impacts about 19 agencies. And the difference there is because <coughs> um, the directive um, requires agencies with $100 million in research and development. So the directive touches things like the Smithsonian and also USAID, whereas uh, FASTER does not. Both limit embargoes. So the cap of an embargo under FASTER is six months. The cap under the directive is 12 months. Um, FASTER does not mention data. The directive requires open access of data. 
both go down the green road of open access. Neither of them mention gold open access. Both require agencies to permit um, Libra OA, so that would be, that would encourage the text mining that Sarah was talking about. And um, the Public Access to Public Science Act just impacts four uh, agencies, so NASA, the NSF, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and the National Weather Service. I love that. I think that's so cool. Like, who knew? The National uh, Weather Service has actually been on their, uh, their habit efforts to uh, commercialize that. They basically require that they sell access. That was heavily funded by weather.com, that legislation. Um, and in the same way as FASTER and the directive, um, this, the Public Access to Public Science Act requires agencies to develop OA policies for peer-reviewed um, scholarship, published in scholarly journals. Um, and it remains to be seen how quickly this news is only been introduced in the House. Um, and Peter Super's website is working on a comparison of all of these. Um, now what's important about this, OSTP, their directive is done, faster is in process. Our next president could rescind the directive, but he or she could not rescind the legislation, which is why advocacy for the legislation must continue. We have to have both present in order for this all to work. So the fight's not over. It's still, still going on. So what does this mean to us here in Illinois? Well, we're one of the states that has been looking at this. Um, New York and California have also had um, their legislative bodies looking at open access, even for scholarship or for text, textbooks and educational materials. So this act was introduced um, probably around the same time as FASTER and the directive were released in February 2003. It was sponsored by um, it came out of the Senate and the House and was sponsored by Democrats and Republicans. Um, although it's commonly known as the BIS bill, yes. because Daniel BIS was the, the person who really um, spearheaded this effort. And he's a former mathematics professor from University of Chicago. Thank you. Um, and his training was, he thought was our for him, but he was also a partner. He speaks in the culture of, of NASA. Um, this went into effect in August 2013. This is a done deal, um, which doesn't mean that all of a sudden we all have to publish open access immediately. What the bill says, what the bill requires, is that each public university <coughs> sets up a task force, and that task force is made up of a um, uh, specific group of people, and Basically, the function of the task force is to um, decide how the, their public university is going to move forward with open access. So at this point, the task force is really the meat of the bill. Um, um, and on um, the Scholarly Commons website at the University of Illinois, on their blog, there is a great FAQ, which I'm going to borrow from Linda Wilson, um, as I talk about this. Um, but I just wanted to kind of talk through the high points of the bill um, to get everybody sort of oriented for our next step. So the chairperson of the Board of Trustees will appoint a task force to examine these points. Um, the voting members, um, there's voting members and non-voting members. The university's library um, must be uh, involved faculty, um, including a labor organization that represents faculty, university administration, um, and non-voting members could include um, a publisher, representatives from publishers. Well, Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, must include, but is not limited to, a publisher who publishes scholarly journals. So not just any publisher. Somebody with the best interest in these discussions. Um, the responsibilities of the task force to review current practices and design a proposed policy 
regarding open access to research articles given a set of issues outlined in the Act. Um, the meetings will be open, so transparency is part of the full process. Um, this is all on or before January 1st of, um, I'm sorry. A report will be released on or before January 1st, 2015. So this came out in August 2013, so there's about a year and a few months for people to do this work on their campuses. Um, the report must include a detailed description of the policy that the task force recommends, that the state or the university adopts, and then a plan for implementation. So not only a proposed policy, but how to make this all happen. The report must be approved by a majority of the task force members. <coughs> Minority reports can be issued, and um, there's also information about who the report goes to. Now, the Act doesn't say what the policy says. That is left to the institutions. Um, it leaves it to the task force to determine, quote, how the public university can best further the open access goals laid out in the Act, whether by creation of an open access policy for the public university, creation of an open access policy for the state, or some other mechanism. Um, it also asks the uh, universities to um, talk about uh, versions of open access of uh, articles. It also talks about um, how infrastructure might work. So how are faculty articles tracked? How are faculty articles, how do libraries or institutions keep track of the work their faculty is doing in order to make um, open access a possibility? Um, I do have the full text of the act if anybody is interested in seeing it. Um, and to get you started thinking about what this could mean on your campuses, since this is brand new, we wanted to give you a chance to look at some current open access policies from kind of the big, big three. Um, Harvard Liberal Arts and Science, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, was the first to release an open access policy. They are the kind of the granddaddy of them all, and that was in 2008. In 2009, MIT followed, and then also in 2008, the faculty of the Graduate School of Education at Stanford release our own open access uh, policy. In 2013, the students follow with their own open access policy. So we actually have these for you to examine. Um, and then what we wanted to do is give you some time, we'll say five minutes, to, and I know that's not very much time, these are short though, they're not very long, um, to look at these. You can do this individually or in groups. And we want you to no, you can keep these. Yeah. Yeah, these are for you to keep. Um, and uh, so we want you to look at what are the commonalities between the three of them. What are the major philosophical points um, that are brought up in these? Because that's really important for these policies is laying out why these are needed and why the university is adopting such a policy. And then um, this says administrators at Chicago State, but insert your own institution there. So we'll sit up until 1.15 and then come back and have a discussion.
in front of you is that these are all policies, and in fact, all the other, most other policies that you find, so the University of Kansas has a policy, Duke has a policy, I mean, there's a lot of institutions now who have these policies in place. In the majority of cases, almost all the cases, they are coming from the faculty, right? So it's the faculty who are having these conversations in faculty senate, you have faculty advocates who are driving these forward. It's generally not the library who's necessarily pushing these um, forward. They might be providing the support infrastructure or providing sort of fact sheets or, you know, sort of other pieces. But they're letting faculty advocates go out there and talk about this. Um, so these are coming, again, coming from faculty, which I think, you know, that's uh, going to be a very interesting, it's a, going to be a very different conversation here in Illinois where the open access policy is coming from the state legislature, right? So it's a shift, yeah. So how have, uh, and looking in particular at the student policy in the back, mm -hmm. so how have uh, publishers who routinely withhold access for a period of time, how have they responded when when provided with the addendum yes. to the transfer of copyright? So it's a really good question. So MIT has probably done the best job of being really public about this. So MIT also has done a lot of work on behalf of their faculty to, to, to contact publishers directly, saying this is our open access policy. You know, will you comply with this? Is this so that individual faculty members don't have to negotiate on their own with publishers, right? So, um, so their electronic resources librarian includes this conversation in contract negotiations, you know. So, um, and other sorts of conversations they're having with with publishers. They also they publicly list the publishers that are complying with the open access policy as well as those who will not comply. Um, so you can see this full list here. Um, and um, <coughs> details for those um, that are uh, in discussion. It's obviously not all publishers, but they add them as they, as they um, can. Um, I will say, and I don't know if you're going to talk about this, but I'll say that there are some publishers that are act, are sort of actively countering these these policies. So Elsevier, for example, in their latest um, offer agreement, basically says if your institution does not have an open access policy, you are free to put your final offer manuscript into the institutional repository. With, there might be some cases where there's an embargo. But you're free to do that. You don't have to worry about that. If your institution has a policy that requires you to put your uh, uh, paper into IR, you must opt out. <laughs> you must opt out. Um, so, so it's basically, a, you know, it's basically saying, you know, institutions that have OA policies, you can't, you have to opt out of it. And that's the other commonality that we didn't mention in all of these, that there's an opt-out policy, right? So there's a way for faculty who are publishing with a publisher that will not comply with the open access policy or won't publish if you have to comply with this policy for you to opt out of the policy, basically to get a waiver um, so you can opt to comply. And Elsevier, as well as a couple of others, are essentially forcing you to, to do that opt out. But if you don't have a policy, it's fine. You can put the stuff into an IR. <coughs> yeah. yeah. We're also wondering what happens with uh, when there's collaboration, like two faculty members working together, and let's say with somebody from Harvard writes an article with uh, somebody from MIT. So in terms of copyright, which institution that's uh, the copyright? Well, in terms of copyright ownership, um, I mean, it's joint copyright held between the authors until they sign it away, right? Um, but um, in terms of the, um, 
the license, because it's non-exclusive, you can grant it to both. So it's not, you don't have to grant it to one or the other. So both institutions could have, could have a copy. Yeah, I think the question you might be asking is that the one that has open access, the one that doesn't have open access, um, both these are the websites, both these are the different policies, the two different policies. That is not exactly the same. Well, I think that it, it because, again, because in most cases, the policies are these non-exclusive licenses, it shouldn't matter because there's joint copyright. You know, both authors have equal full copyright in the article. It's not one or the other. So you can, you know, as long as, so if you have joint copyright, so if I have, if we author an article together, as long as I'm not making an exclusive agreement in terms of transfer of copyrights, if I'm making non-exclusive agreements, I can do that without asking Stephanie's permission to do that, as long as it's not exclusive. If I'm doing exclusive, I do have to ask. We both have to agree to, to do that. Now, I will say that, you know, there's often there's ethical issues, obviously. <laughs> if we're co-authoring something, I don't want to do something with it, you know, without Stephanie knowing. And that conversation should happen at the outset. Yeah, not like, oh, wait, we have this agreement, right? What are we going to do? Right, which actually happened to me once. It was a Taylor and Francis journal, and um, I was actually co-authoring something with my husband. And both of us were just really starting to learn about all this, and so we got to that point where we had to sign an agreement, and we submitted um, the Spark addendum. Spark has this great addendum pre-written, and all you have to do is, you know, submit that along with the publisher's copyright agreement, um, and say, you know, I want to be able to put this in the right of my repository. I want to be able to post this on my website. And the editor, who is a colleague from U of I, came back and said, sorry, Taylor and Francis does not accept author data. And so then we were kind of like, oh, like we should have had this conversation a long time ago. Um, and we had to decide whether or not we wanted to pull our article, which had already gone through the whole peer review process. We had already revised it a couple times, and they were really enthusiastic about it. And we thought, you know, we, we, can't, we, we must publish this just because of all the work these people, our colleagues, have put into it for free. So we went ahead and published it, and then um, immediately put it up on both of our repositories, the postprint, which we were you know, allowed to do. Yeah. So a, a similar kind of scenario, um, we think, let's, let's say I'm a tenured faculty member at Harvard, and I write my article, and, you know, Elsevier refuses to play the ball. And I instead say, forget it. I don't need to be published in your journal for any kind of prestige or whatever. I'd rather have this be accessible to everyone. Um, I'm not a tenured faculty member at Harvard. I'm a tenured associate professor here at Chicago State. Mm -hmm. So the game is different for me um, because you know that tenured person leaves Harvard and tries to get a job elsewhere. I think the fact that he or she was a professor at Harvard um, you know, will, will carry a different kind of weight than my status as a former professor at Chicago State. So ultimately, aren't the I understand the publishers want to make money. Um, but aren't they kind of shooting themselves in the foot? Because if enough of these kind of snazzier researchers are opting out, then these previously highly respected journals are going to be filled with not, I would hope and imagine, not any lesser of caliber of research, because I imagine that good researchers could be anywhere, right? And good writers. But um, <clears throat> there's that cash in that's going to be lost. So aren't they going to get it in the end anyway? Don't they realize? I'm sure they realize this because they make money. They've got to be much smarter than I am. But I mean, I, mean, I think they're. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I would say. I mean, and also be yourselves Vigo. And Vigo, the, the site, you know, the cost per faculty member to subscribe to Vigo is it, huge. And you think it's, you know, it's exactly the university you put together and pull that out but, yeah. rather than going after the core vision. Yeah, I mean, I think the question about publishers and open access is. Really interesting. Um, I think publishers.
to recognize the sea change that's happening. Um, Forest is an example of that. I think their efforts to do things. Publishers are doing a lot of work to try to find um, other revenue streams than strictly content, right? So they're doing things like SciVal, which is, have you guys seen or heard of SciVal? So SciVal is essentially a, you know, they brand it as a researcher profile system, but it's essentially a system where they're mining all of their data. So you can buy SciVal for, you know, it's $125,000 or more, or, you know, less depending on the size of your institution, but it's a lot of money. Um, and basically what it does is it presents, you know, so it takes all of the, the articles that, you know, say your Department of Sociology are creating, it does, it can do things like sort of show you the amount of money coming into the department through the funded research. It can also do things like show you sort of market share. So they're using very commercial terms. And they're selling this to provost office, right? So this is something that you can say, okay, my department of sociology is, is I want to build up this area here. Can I buy, I can buy a profile of my competitor, my competitor's uh, profile over here to see which faculty perhaps I could potentially coach um, if, I, if I could try to. I mean, so they're basically creating sort of this competitive intelligence platform for universities to bolster programs to better understand the money coming into programs. I mean, so this is this is an area that you know publishers are really are really um, trying to find other ways to to bolster their their revenue. Many commercial publishers, um, and you know, this is an area where I wish um, you know universities that had the wherewithal to be able to. Um, do a better job at sort of keeping this data ourselves and mining this type of data ourselves, right? Um, because we're, you know, we're, it's, it's all just metadata mostly, and they're selling it back to us with these really crazy um, and fascinating. I mean, it's fascinating. If you ever get a chance to take a look at this, it is really, really fascinating <laughs> to see um, sort of the output and. Um, you know, where your university sits. And some very, particularly the sciences, they really get into these very fine subdisciplines. Um, so you can really see the changes there. So it's really, really interesting. Many offices of research are quite interested in this. Certainly offices of the provost, other sort of administrator types um, are getting sold on, on you know, this type of information. And, it, it makes sense when you think about the, the pressure to be accountable to, right. you know, if you're a public institution, you need to be accountable to your taxpayer. If you're a private institution, you need to be accountable to, you know, whatever rating system that we're going to be coming up against um, if that, you know, if that goes forward under the, um, the Obama administration. So I can see why this is really attractive to institutions because it helps you create and put forth that message of here's how we're accountable and here's how we're fulfilling our mission and here's what our community is getting out of it. But, sorry. Sure, there are some different competitors. So there's a product called Pivot, which comes out of ProQuest, which doesn't do quite the same thing, but it does some similar pieces of uh, with the funding area. Um, there's also uh, one open source product um, called Evo, uh, which is was started by Cornell and is now an open large open source product, which doesn't do quite the same competitive analysis. It is a researcher profile system, and it does show a lot of things like you know where collaborations are happening at a university, so it can show co-authors, but also across institutions. So it sort of helps give you an overview of where collaborations are happening, where they're not happening, the type of funding that's that's coming in. So um, I would say those are probably the three main products in this in this area. Um, they all do slightly different things. 
you know, Cyval really has the edge in terms of the overall sort of all of these different pieces together. Though I will say this relies on data from Scopus, which is much weaker in the humanities in some social sciences, right? So, you know, it's and this, that's something you have to repeatedly <laughs> repeatedly talk to people about because it's just it's as good as the data is in Scopus, essentially. So which is a problem. Two more things and then we'll start. Yeah, great. So in talking about um, the implementation of a policy, I think uh, education and outreach, both, both pre and post policy, are absolutely vital. Getting messages um, across to people and creating those messages so we all have a shared understanding of some of this jargon and some of the requirements or the requirements. Uh, oh, also, with your, will your policy come with funding for gold open access um, or for article fees? Um, what about data? How will your policy um, treat data? What about student work? What about undergraduate student work? What about graduate student work, theses and dissertations? Um, something that I face continually at my institution is what if postprints aren't available? What if a postprint, which is the author's final manuscript after a peer review, um, what if a faculty member says, oh, you know, once it's published, I just toss that. I don't, I don't keep that. Why would I? But if that's the only thing I can post, then I'm out of luck. How do you get faculty to comply? And how do you get them to comply on a regular basis? How do we make this a habit that faculty get into? How do we change their behavior? Um, and I, I just wanted to uh, end with um, two things. On Harvard's website, there's actually a great document that leads you through a model of open access policy. So they present sort of a general policy, and then they have it annotated with supporting language and why you might do it this way or another way. It is fantastic. Um, and I can put that that URL in the slides as well. Um, and then the last thing is why we're all doing this. I was sharing with Sarah that there is a great, completely horrible actually, this video of Jake Andraka. Um, has anybody heard of Jake Andraka? He's a 15-year-old inventor. He's a sophomore in high school. And a family friend of, uh, of a friend of their family passed away from pancreatic cancer. And if you know anything about pancreatic cancer, you know that um, once it's detected, in most cases there's very little that can be done. So Jake set his mind to this and developed over the course of a few years, developed an early detection test. And that early detection test is, um, is won him the Intel Prize, um, I think last year. And it's actually in production now. It's going to be available.